What about that from Scar to Fleming? Fleming trying to go around. Kaslik, oh, she's done so and gets the offload away. That is absolutely brilliant from England. Stretching the legs, Abigail Brown. Will she be caught? Race for the line. Brown, the captain for England, crashes down and gets the ball down. Wasn't a try. The more you sweat in training, the less you'll bleed in battle. Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of the Sports for Champions podcast. Today I'm joined by Team GB's Rugby Sevens captain, Abby Brown. How are you, Abby? Yeah, I'm very well, thank you. How are you? I'm great, thank you. Uh, thanks for joining us today. It's a great pleasure um, to have you here. Um, so if you could start, uh, could you tell us a little bit about how you got into rugby? Yeah, of course. So when I was six, I used to kind of you know I'd do whatever a six-year-old would do um and my brother was playing down at the local rugby club um at Clumpton and I basically just got bored on a Sunday watching and I just turned to my parents and I was like I want to play um and kind of since that day uh, my dad um, took me to to rugby my mum would take my brother to rugby and kind of swap I remember switching cars at one point because we had to go somewhere else so yeah um kind of just played with the boys up until I was about 12 and then had to play with the girls because that's kind of the age you had to change over um but, but back in the day there was never really many girls in the local area so we had to kind of fix a team together um my dad bless him he was amazing um he basically coached coached my team but we used to go and pick up the girls because some people wouldn't be able to get to training and stuff like that so just so that I could play on a weekend um so yeah my dad was an absolute hero um kind of bringing together loads of girls and I also just dragged all my mates to it as well so <laughs> they kind of hate them for it but <laughs> you almost need someone like that when there isn't that platform yeah. for you to go and play um how were the attitudes towards girls in rugby when you first started do you remember yeah I, I kind of remember like one particular tournament where this guy on the boy on the other team was like oh my god I can't tackle a girl like that I can't do that and the boys on my team responded with like, right, let's just give Ab the ball because she's going to score us all the tries. So it was a it was a mixture. Um, the people on my team didn't really care. Like they were just like cared if I was good or not, um, which I think helped teach me kind of actually just to be the best version of you. And kind of if I wasn't good enough, then they would not, not slate me, but they would slate me because I wasn't good enough, not because I was a girl. Um, so yeah, I worked really hard to, to kind of, be good and be the best person player I could be when I was younger. Um, but I, I loved it. I loved playing with the boys. They were great crack and like a couple of them now like stay in touch and stuff. So yeah, is there a good bunch? That's brilliant. Um, and do you remember? Were you particularly athletic at that time? Were you playing any other sports or maybe in school? Yeah, I literally played every sport growing up. Um, netball, basketball, I did swimming, I did tennis. Like you name it. I was kind of out most evenings. Um, every weekend I was out. Like I remember when I was probably. A little bit older maybe 14 15 and was kind of going through high school and you're kind of going through that weird transition of like growing up and being a girl and all this kind of stuff but I would always play rugby I would always be that person like play basketball with the boys like at lunchtime it'd be like right what game are we playing like and all my friends wanted to just sit and just like chat and I was like no I want to go play sports so um kind of went through that battle but I do remember on a Saturday or a Sunday morning I had rugby in the morning and then I had netball in the afternoon and obviously going from rugby it was like muddy it was like gross and I literally had to get in the car I didn't even have time to shower wow. and went straight and put my netball dress on I had like muddy <laughs> knees and I was like, on, the, on the court um and yeah I remember all the girls being like you've been at rugby today haven't you and I'm like yeah I have like trying to wipe with like baby wipes and stuff so yeah that was kind of interesting but I mean I wouldn't change it because yeah I absolutely love sports I think um, on the eye test, it can look like a big sort of physically quite bruising game rugby, but it is quite technical. Um, do you first sort of remember that uh, moment when you realised that you've really got a sort of technical talent for the actual game rugby? Um, yes and no. I think when I got selected for kind of Southwest stuff and kind of when you're 13, 14, you kind of go through divisional, you go for county stuff and as I kind of progressed I was like oh maybe I'm kind of good at this and then like getting selected for like under 20s England under 20s and just kind of going to those and being selected to start and like things like that I was just like oh that's kind of good and like my dad always said to me he was like you've got something like there's something about you like you really understand this game like you really get it um and like obviously when your dad says it he's biased so like, I'm like you're biased dad but mm. kind of looking back at it, I'm like well maybe he was right like I did have something that perhaps like some of the other people didn't have necessarily um 
so yeah I, it was a it was a weird one I think when you're selected and you're kind of going through the ranks I guess um you get more confident so then you're like oh maybe I am actually all right at this <laughs> yeah it makes sense I guess um, I know you were selected or you was it a decision that you had to make to go to the specialist sports college presumably you had friends off going doing A-levels at different places I'm guessing it must have been a bit of a crossroads for you yeah so we I was either to go to Exeter College do A-levels and do the Netball Academy there or I went to Hartbury College in Gloucester um, which mean, meant I had to move away from home um, and do academics but with the rugby mm. And I vividly remember sitting down with my mum and dad and we did a pros and cons list um, of both colleges, everything, and we just let it lie. Just kind of like, let's talk about it and then like just chew over the fat kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And there were so many cons for going to Hartbury and there were so many pros going to Exeter. And it was like this one, and then just one day, my friend was like, I'm going to go to Hartbury, one of the rugby girls. And I was like, I am too. Like, I just I was like, no, I, I can't not go. Like, I can't do that. Even if, even though the amount of cons was literally outweighed <laughs> outweighed it so much um and then I just was like let's just do it let's just see what it's about and that my dad was always like the worst thing that can happen is you can just come home like it's not a big deal um like it'll be fine we'll support you and I'm very very fortunate my parents are so supportive um and always have been so I guess that kind of helped make the decision a bit easier it's a recurring theme um I think a lot of the athletes that we talk to here uh supportive parents yeah. runs through everybody really and I think um, we all owe a lot to our parents in general but I think especially in sport it seems like um, so you were, pl- you were playing at college and I think you were uh, picked up there by was it the Bristol Bears mm-hmm. um, is that to play 15s? Yeah so played 15s um, down at your local club like if you want to progress you kind of got to get when I was like 18 kind of got to join a women's side mm-hmm. um, and they were the local premiership club at the time so yeah joined Bristol had a great time great season um and then got picked up through England because of that uh, and what position what was your position at that time outside centre so yes. I played yeah I used to before I went to college I played 10 mm-hmm. so I played for half um all the way through basically my childhood which maybe helped with like you're saying that like technique t- uh, tactical side of things mm-hmm. right so like actually because I was a decision making player yeah so for people maybe maybe who don't know that would be like the quarterback role almost um and then so then the uh, an outside center that's more sort of running based a little bit um and then i know that when you play sevens now you play hooker which is a completely different role altogether can (laughs) tell us a little bit about those different roles and some of the different skills needed to do well in them yeah so obviously with being a center in 15s you kind of you need a bit of all sorts um but it is about that kind of playing off other people um more so whereas 10 you kind of pull the strings so you put people through the hole or whatever it might be whereas sense is the, probably the person that's going through the hole mm-hmm. um if that makes sense that's really whistle sort tour of that but um <laughs> and then again with sevens i've kind of played pretty much every position there is in sevens um but last year um just before tokyo they moved me to hooker because they were like you've got an engine like you can last you kind of my work rate is kind of my super strength so like I will always hit breakdowns I'll like make sure I'm here there and everywhere um I've got like a really good very fortunate <laughs> have a fitness base um which some of my friends don't like before but yeah, it's uh, very fortunate to have that and then kind of you do a bit of like the dog work I guess um which I love the bit I love about sevens as well but then you also are in positions on the pitch to really make an impact so yeah it's sevens is a bit of everything you need to just like have decision making and it's got to be super quick and put people through spaces and good handling and all the other side of it so yeah i that's where i think i found my love with sevens um so you said you've got a a fitness base is that something that you've uh is that something you've kind of grown up with naturally or is that something you've really worked on i I have had it naturally oh i will be honest um i don't know whether or not because i did loads of sports growing up um but I was always the kid that did like 1500 and cross country and like things like that I was always very blessed in that area um so it's yeah I definitely think it's more of a natural thing but again like I now because I know it's natural I like work even harder at it because I'm like well I know I can be good at it you know yeah um, makes sense. so um can you tell us a little bit about that first call from England can you tell us how that came about and sort of your first cap how that felt to represent your country yeah, so when I first got capped with sevens, I remember sitting, um, I, was, I think I was at home and we'd just gone back, got back from a social sevens tournament um, 
and I was in the car and my parents were like, I was like, I've got this call from someone, I'm not sure who it is. And obviously um, it was a head coach basically being like, we want to take you away just to see what you're like about and give you a shot really. Um, and I actually had injured my hip. So I was like panicking. So I was like, what if I can't go mm. and all this kind of stuff. So, um, but yeah, that was that when I was quite young that. So I, it's a loose memory, but the one with 15s, I remember it so well because me and my friend who at the same college were expecting a call mm-hmm. if we were going to be selected into the squad or not for the Six Nations in 2015. Um, and we actually had a lecture, um, but I remember being like, we can't go until we've had this call, like, because what if we get it halfway through mm-hmm. and all this kind of stuff? So we like sacked the lecture off. <laughs> um, sorry to my teachers who, if anyone's listening, um, <laughs> sacked that off, and then basically just sat in our room and we just like stared at the, like our phones, and like we both kind of got ph- phone calls simultaneously. Um, and me and my best mate were basically both selected um, to do the Six Nations. So off the back of the 15s girls just winning the World Cup in 2014. So, I mean, it was a huge honour, like a big um, a big challenge. We were like 18, 19. So it was like quite big boots to fill. Um, and kind of just embraced the whole opportunity with it. Um, it was definitely tough. Like it was really hard because uh, we'd been in the situations where we'd only really done like a year of senior rugby um, and now all of a sudden they want us to go play for England against Wales and you're like, what, like what's going on? <laughs> um, but yeah, it, w- it was super cool. How, how was the jump in the level um, go playing international rugby compared to a club and then obviously college rugby before that? Yeah, I think it was huge. Like I don't think I realised how big a jump. Mm. Um, you know, we had under 20s, but even under 20s to seniors was just a massive leap. Mm. Um, because you're not just playing with like three age ranges, you're literally playing with just the best of the any, best. Yeah, yeah, the best of the best, and any age over eighteen. So, it's it was hard. It was really hard. Um, What's the biggest difference in terms of is it like the physicality or the skill level or everything? I think a bit of everything, but probably the skill level mm. um, was the hardest bit because everything's then faster. Mm. So, and everything's harder. Everything's stronger. Everything's hits hard everyone everything hurts more like you know so it's yeah. it, it's everything accumulated into one i think um but yeah i mean it's you kind of get used to it but the, definitely the first season i had a lot of bumps and bruises bit of an adjustment <laughs> period so if i could fast forward a little bit uh, i know you had quite a difficult uh, qualification process for tokyo can you tell us a little bit about that yeah so in the lead up to olympics you have to come top four in the world series so we do a world series every year so it's like um you go away like once a month to like a new place um we obviously didn't do that we were kind of ranked 2019 this was we were ranked between fifth and eighth um and we basically went to a standalone tournament where you go have to win the tournament to, to qualify um the teams we had to beat were like russia spain ireland france and they were all ranked above us like france basically should have done it on the world series like there was they were like the team to beat um and we actually ended up with like a really hard run into it and like just everything about the tournament like we just shouldn't have won like the people we had probably like yeah we we had a great team like the team itself was great but we just we obviously weren't clicking that whole season mm. um and we just like backs against the wall we were definitely the underdogs going into it i think um <coughs> those teams definitely should have beaten us but we basically managed to beat Ireland in the quarterfi- quarterfinals, France in the semi-finals, and we beat Russia in the final. Sorry. Okay. <clears throat> Which obviously for us, it was like amazing. Um, and definitely, yeah, one thing that we had so much stuff going on off pitch. So our coach was changing. Um, there was just loads of political stuff that happens in sport that was going on. It was like the end of our season. So contracts were being renewed and everything like that. So yeah lots going on and we definitely shouldn't have won it but we absolutely smashed it um and definitely one of like the best achievements like i've ever done that is amazing it does seem to be a bit of a recurring theme around england's women rugby um where you might not have the best season but kind of when it matters most you do seem to be able to pull a result out of the bag um is that something that you guys are aware of yourselves yeah especially like the 15s girls are a bit different they've been absolutely smashing it um for the last two three seasons um and now at their world cup out, out in new zealand but for the sevens program it, it's definitely been that case it's we've had a kind of a real tough 
tough ride with things that my pretty much my whole career like every season's been a bit different we're constantly changing squads like yearly which if you look at it like you we're performing against teams that have been together for six seven years so it's kind of you know you're you're trying to battle with someone that's already got that experience um which is really hard um so yeah it it is really difficult because the sevens program's been so inconsistent however i do believe that when we get some consistency and we get like the the funding and the backing the facilities and everything that goes with it and all the political stuff is kind of dealt with then we perform really well on the pitch but it's just when everything there's so much that goes on behind the scenes that kind of impacts then how you play which has been unfortunate for the sevens because it's kind of had a bit of taken a bit of a back step um but it is going to get there hopefully. it is so important <laughs> to all team sports across the board really to have that consistency and to sort of um to give you the platform to play because if you know sort of who you're going to be playing with and you've had like good preparation leading up to it that gives you then a bit of freedom to actually yeah. go and express yourselves and enjoy your game um i do think it's the case that uh you can only pull it out of the bag so many times before sort of the the, yeah. the better more prepared teams um will eventually come out on top um so i know you're probably a little bit disappointed with the end result of the work at the olympics but uh obviously going to tokyo under quite strange conditions as well can you tell us a little bit about the actual games yeah it was it was very odd um you know covid was like super strict um <clears throat> everywhere we went it was like masks on testing um we actually got a scare the opening ceremony night we were going to get to the opening ceremony we we're going to go into the village it was all going to be amazing and as soon as you're in the village it was like cool you're you're good like even if you got covid like but you didn't have any symptoms like you're fine like you kind of you're almost like safe it was just getting into the village yeah um and one of our teammates basically were on the bus and it was so hot i remember it being so hot and obviously we've got all these masks on mm. um got outside the village and they were like so and so like two of the guys like can you come to the front and we were all sat there like what's going on like no one was really telling us anything and all of a sudden you see the two girls at the front everyone all the staff and who were at the front moved back towards us and we were like oh my god they've got covid like they've got covid um so we're sat there and i kid you not we were sat for two hours we were literally sat for two hours while they're trying to talk because they were like they thought it was like a false positive they were like there's no way you can get covid right now like it we were in like honestly like a bubble like mm. we we're in the safest environment like to a point we're having food and we'd have like a mask up between us here like wow. a, a everything was like basically like a big sheet and mm. like you were just eating like you eating with people but you you weren't it was so bizarre um and i mean it was it was necessary for for what they thought so absolutely and you kind of just yeah fine do whatever you have to do um but yeah so we got a scare we came back we had to isolate all in our rooms like food got brought to like our rooms and like we then had to they, the people had to retest we had to retest um and then it was like okay next day oh, actually you're fine and you can just go into the village so <coughs> it was it was definitely a close call yeah, <laughs> that's wow. for sure and um, that's obviously not ideal preparation but uh, what would you normally be doing in the lead up to a tournament i mean obviously not just sat in your room isolating but presumably yeah. you'd be ticking over or you're going for any skills work or yeah. what would you normally be doing yeah to be fair it was um it wasn't too bad because we were kind of we weren't training the next day so it was kind of like it worked out all right mm. um but often or not there you're like off days um mm. to relax or whatever and actually we were training or we were um, traveling sorry <clears throat> really sorry about this cough by the way <laughs> so you're going to enjoy editing this um, yeah so went to uh, no sorry what were we saying about the travelling and stuff um, yeah prep wise we would usually have longer as well so because of Covid we actually only had six months oh, okay. before Tokyo leading up to it to be a squad so um, however many people invited to be in the squad 24 I think it was um, and only 13 went so you're cutting that obviously literally in half so yeah um yeah it was very challenging kind of six months because also we were in covid times we were in our own rooms we were in camps but in our own rooms everywhere was masks it yeah, was just disruptions it, everywhere yeah and i think the thing is what going in so obviously like the one thing that was a real shame is that no one could come and watch um not necessarily just families and stuff like obviously that was really sad um because i would have loved like my family to be there 
my teammates families but actually the people of japan weren't even allowed to come which they were gonna do and i was like that's the bit actually like you can just invite schools and stuff like that like and that w- it wouldn't really matter it would matter because you'd want your loved ones there but it wouldn't matter as much um but they stopped all of that so it's it was very different um very very different but it was yeah <coughs> it was it was amazing at the same time I'm sure the next games um, it'll make up for it and I think obviously one of the biggest uh, parts about sports is the participation of the crowd um, and obviously a big uh, the biggest sort of sporting event in the world at the Olympics then um, it'd be, it's a real shame to miss out on that but I'm sure it'll be put to put, to put right in the future hopefully um, can you tell us a little <coughs> bit about where you think women's rugby is, is at the moment obviously we've seen great success uh, in the football over the summer and things really do seem to be changing there so just interested to get your opinion on it yeah so women, women's sport for me is changing um, you know the football girls did an amazing job and but they did an amazing job because they put on a platform and that people were, could watch it and it was accessible. And I think that's the difference is why it's kicked off is because it was accessible. Um, you know, we've been, people have been playing football, people have been playing rugby, like we've been playing it for years. It's just not been accessible. Like the girls, um, six nation, uh, 15s have really got a big backing at the moment. There was loads of people at their Six Nations games and they took it all over the country. Like it was amazing like tens thousands of people like I think one of the games was like 15,000 people were like there to watch it and it was just that for me I was like oh it's not just my mum and dad going to watch these kind of games anymore it's like it genuinely is like a family game there's those of kids there's those and I think that's what is amazing about it is that it is getting there um and obviously when a team does well you get even more backing and you get more accessibility so it's credit to the players, I think, in the football team and the girls out in the World Cup at the moment, who I'm sure, touch wood, they will bring it home and they'll get that um, World Cup because they've worked so hard and they are the people to beat. Um, and it's credit to the players, I think, to go... <coughs> credit to the players to be actually like, we we want this to be better. We need we want it to be you know accessible. We want it to, to be able to follow our journey for for you know brands to go oh actually let's let's get behind that and um yeah i i think it's it is getting there um i think for for us for the sevens it's really hard because we play all over the place so if you're playing in canada and the time difference is six seven hours Mm. like having a game at 2 a.m just isn't really that accessible but i think there's definitely something missing with sevens um because we do everything alongside the men as well so it's not even like the men get better than we get it's generally like how do you access sevens more um there's something that needs to be done with that but in terms of women's like growing and for rugby in this country is it's huge um and like there's under 13s under 15s under 18s there's so many different sections now within women's sport uh, women's rugby sorry that that is only gonna get bigger and better Yeah, it is really positive and it's great to see, um, it's definitely great to see more and more girls getting involved, which obviously is only going to bolster the sport for the future, the better the talent coming through and then the more likely they are to actually put it on TV and to give people the opportunity to take part and then obviously it just snowballs from there. Um, Do you think there's anything in particular that motivated you to try it? Because obviously there's not um there wasn't really t- too many role models uh, and like you said there wasn't many girls in the area playing whatsoever um do you think there's anything in particular that really pushed you to uh, really uh, follow the rugby path as it were um i think i just i always wanted to be better like i've always like my drive and stuff to just keep being better and at what i do and be happy doing it um me and my dad's always like as long as you're happy like it doesn't matter and I think it's so true and every time I played sport or I played rugby I was just happy I was happy doing it so then I was like well if I'm enjoying it and I'm kind of good at it like I can be better at it as well so (coughs) I think that definitely pushed me to be like okay cool I want to just keep being better I want to you know strive for the next thing and kind of the environment I'm now in it's like how do you keep you're never satisfied so you're never fit enough you're never strong enough you're mm. never and it's always there's always this kind of clog that's ticking um because you're never where you want to be and I don't know if you ever will be and I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing but 
probably more recently after COVID, I've just learned to just enjoy the journey. So like really have enjoyment in everything I do along the way rather than just going, okay, that one big goal at the end, actually let's just enjoy everything in between, enjoy day to day, like live a happy lifestyle, live a healthy lifestyle. And then if that then big thing comes and that's great, but if not, I'm enjoying it as I go, you know? Yeah, I think it's so much easier to uh, put in the hard work if you're just enjoying the mm-hmm. process, like you said. Um, how do you see, you said early on that uh, you were quite naturally talented towards uh, the sort of things that you need to be good at rugby. Um, how do you see the roles of talent and hard work playing against each other? Yeah, it's an interesting one because I think if you don't work hard, you can have all the talent in the world, but you're never going to get anywhere. Mm. Um, <coughs> but again, if you you work really hard but you like you have no talent it's you know you're kind of fighting against a brick wall so I think it definitely is hand in hand but I do think if you work harder like talent you will learn talent because you're willing to try you're willing to to get better you're you know you'll do anything you can to be the best passer is the best tackler even if you're not extremely talented in that um, like area um and I think that's the thing I love about rugby it's that we say rugby is for all and it really is because you can have such a variation of body types of like what you look like where you're from and all the kind of bits in between and it there is a place really for everyone and you don't necessarily have to look a certain way or be a certain way you can just be whatever you want to be um but majority of not like people i've been with that like if you if you work hard you succeed if you if you don't you you kind of you don't but you're also happy because you're not willing to work hard, you know? Mm. So, yeah, I think a bit of both, if that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. Um, and how often are you training at the moment? At the moment, it's actually my off-season, so I'm not training. Yeah. <laughs> but usually we would train pretty much every day. We'd have probably two, two maybe three days off a week if we're lucky. Um, wow. But, yeah, you kind of, you're in, the, you're in the gym, you're doing your fitness, or you're doing, like, rugby sessions. So it's, or if we're in camp, we have... <clears throat> sorry <coughs> if we're in camp we've got meetings um yeah and various different things to attend so it's it's definitely full on <laughs> uh, how does it um work out in terms of like gym work compared to like ball work or just running how does all that how do all them kind of fit together yeah it varies like within the season so like probably like your pre-season before competition stuff even starts your fitness you got in the gym more you probably four times a week in the gym you're doing more running mm. Um, as well as like skills and rugby stuff whereas as soon as competition <coughs> as soon as competition stuff comes you drop all that down and you just do more more rugby stuff so towards the back end of the season we had loads of competitions and we would probably train in the gym once maybe twice a week with really short sessions whereas we were on the pitch quite a bit um, but then as soon as then like, like I said the a week out before competition you're only out on the pitch for like half an hour, 45 minutes, mm. you're in the gym for half an hour and then that's kind of it because you're peaking, you're not, you're, you're like maintaining then because you've done every, you've done all the hard throughout the season. Um, so it definitely changes, yeah. And through aer- aerobic, anaerobic, all that kind of stuff. Throughout, yeah, I don't know how, they must, they plan it so well, but uh, <laughs> but over my head. Nice. Um, and then in terms of nutrition, is that something that you take quite an active role in or is it? Does that get given to you in terms of meal plans and stuff? Yeah, so I, I have to like kind of have that active role. Mm. Um, it's definitely something that I probably need to get better at, want to get better at, um, and definitely an area that I think is it's really difficult because for us, if you can't, I don't believe you can maintain like a really good, really strict kind of diet throughout your the whole year because mm. it's just it's just not possible. Um, and especially with women, obviously we go through the menstrual cycle, so you've got all of those kind of things that play a big impact in that. And I think you kind of have to, it's so individual, um, but I do think there's probably a piece of that um, as sevens players, we don't eat enough because what we're doing, how hard we're working on the pitch, we probably don't eat as much as we probably should be eating to actually replenish that, let alone just live as a normal human. So mm. yeah, there's a, definitely a bit in that. Um, and definitely we don't actually have like a nutritionist or anything but it's something that moving forward is like I'm going to help try and get the, the squad to have and because I think it's so important and if you don't know then how do you know you know it's yeah. that, that classic saying you don't know what you don't know so um, and especially we've got quite a lot of young girls in our squad that probably need a bit of guidance with that 
Yeah, the world of sports only recently changed <coughs> um, to incorporate that kind of stuff, but it is so important to obviously fuel fuel your engine, as it were. Yeah. Um, there's a lot to remember there. Do you think that the life of an athlete is tough compared to maybe other professions? It is tough. It is tough. I think it's really difficult because everyone's like, your, your dream job, you've got your dream job. And like, it is like, don't get me wrong, it, it really is. But it also is hard work. Like it's, I don't just, you know, turn up to work and it's like, okay, cool. I finished the day at, at four. Like it's a lifestyle. Mm. Um, and I, I believe that when you play sport professionally, it is a lifestyle. It's not a job. Um, so it, although it's, it's probably not the toughest. I'm sure there's definitely tougher ones and people work extremely hard in their own profession. But yeah, it's definitely a lifestyle choice, which can be hard. Um, did you have a favorite sporting hero growing up? Yeah, um, my kind of hero is probably Serena Guthrie. She's a Guthrie. She's a netball legend. Um, she just was, she played center at the time and that was the position I used to play. Um, and she was just unreal at netball. You know, her fitness was next level. Um, and yeah, she really, <coughs> uh, she really like kind of stood out for me as like someone that worked really hard and kind of obviously got the reward that, that she deserves. Oh, that's brilliant. And then do you have a favorite sporting quote? Um, I do, I do have a quote. It's about, hopefully I get it right. Um, Life isn't about waiting for the storm to pass, it's learning to dance in the rain that's brilliant yeah. um, and then do you think that that's something that you apply maybe to your sport obviously that's a big life quote but do you think that's something that uh, do you ever have to weather the storm in rugby and that kind all of comes the time. to mind <laughs> all the time and I think that's why I like that quote is that, that you're always going to get stuff thrown at you um, especially in rugby especially in uh, <coughs> especially in the environment I'm currently in and you know it's it's a absolute roller coaster ride like I always talk about like the roller coaster ride especially in sevens and even to a point of how when you play over a weekend it's like a roller coaster of emotions so like it's it kind of impacts in everything I do um and yeah kind of that's the whole piece of enjoying the journey that's that learning to dance is the is the enjoying part uh, does being an athlete make you a better person I believe so <laughs> um yeah I think it definitely gives you your values and your or um it tests your morals it tests your what you're about as a human but it also allows you to understand someone else I think um you know it, you really put when you're tested and you're kind of backs against the wall with a team and you're basically going to fight um you really learn a lot about yourself in those situations but also the people and I think if you can keep being better as a as a person then then you're definitely going to be better as an athlete um so obviously as the sevens captain you're selected for a reason can you tell us a bit about why you think that might be um yeah it will it's an interesting one when i first got asked to be captain it was kind of like like i think you would be good at this in the kind of not necessarily then but like in the long run like oh, you'd wow. be really good at this and i was like 20 i'd only been in the squad a season um and I just was like okay and I, I definitely made some mistakes along the way you know um tried to be that person or this person or do it this way um and it just wasn't right it wasn't right for me and I think I'm I really think about the people like I put people before myself um which is a good thing but also can be a negative sometimes in sport um but I think I'm good at kind of understanding where the squad is at so I've got a good feel for it so like I, I know if something's not quite right or whatever and I think it's also helped me to really understand and kind of saying about my morals and stuff but like what I believe in it to be right or wrong or whatever um and fair if I don't think something's fair like I will say it I will just be like no that's not okay even if you're a coach or whoever you are or play or whatever um I've kind of gained that um I guess confidence to go actually no like, we need to stand up for this because there's that's not okay or even go the other way and go that was really good like we need to make sure we keep doing this you know so it's I've definitely kind of got a bit of a an act of it um but I'm not sure I saw it at the time I think I was just like a rabbit in headlights when I first was captain but yeah I think hopefully now the girls think I'm all right <laughs> that's brilliant um and then does that mean that you give a little pre-match talk or anything like that yeah um always give a pre-match talk kind of don't really have anything I normally go to it depends on the the mood or the the game we're about to play um who we're about to play sometimes you don't need to say a lot 
I'm a fan believer of less is more mm. um, and kind of lead by actions like you know, um, how I am as a player and what I play like and stuff like that rather and how hard I work rather than you know giving a 15 10 10 15 minute speech isn't really me um but yeah hopefully the the girls appreciate it. and I like to do little things like ha- always high five the girls before we go out and just like little things like that to to know that I'm kind of with them on on this kind of journey but also what we're about to go and do I think so much of it is about um settling your team before the game how, how do you feel before a game do you feel nervous or depends what kind of game it is um I've learned to kind of not feel that nervous for games anymore and it, it's a weird one but I think it's because I'm so focused on the team mm. and I'm so focused on okay what are we going to go and do the coach just said these are the three points how can I then remind the girls right this is other three points and like constantly rather than think okay how do I feel about this game mm. um there's a couple of games like recently I felt really nervous for but it's because of like the environment and the competition it was for and things like that so it's yeah it's a it's a hard on managing your own like nerves but knowing that I'm sure other people feel just as nervous even probably more nervous than I'm feeling so it's kind of like okay how do I then help them manage that um and I co-captain the squad with with Meg Jones and she she's amazing as well we're very different captains but um I guess it's kind of easier when there's someone else to kind of lean on no it works yeah um and then in terms of uh, would you have any advice for a young person maybe looking to start their career in sport and then maybe even if there's something specific to rugby yeah I think just give sport a go like give every sport a go especially if you're a kid like because you never know what you might be good at or what you might love more or whatever and I think the big biggest thing for me especially when you're growing up is like the people you meet um, like my best friends <clears throat> my best friends are definitely sorry okay. <clears throat> my best friends are definitely who I've made through sport um, so I think it's give things a go like try it out and especially if you want to get into rugby like just go down to your local club and just ask about it um, Pete the way it's going at the moment like little boys little girls like it's just getting so much momentum so just try it um, try it is the biggest thing for me I think Brilliant. Um, and then what are you looking forward to in the future, maybe for your team and then for women's rugby in general? Yeah, so looking forward to kind of moving to GB. We're moving to GB from England this season um, and then on to Paris in 2024 is the big, the big goal. Um, but I guess more just enjoying the journey again. Um, it's a couple of busy years for, for sevens <coughs> and hopefully off the back of the work girls, hopefully going to win the World Cup. I think it's just going to bring so much more momentum in, in England. So, yeah, really looking forward to the next few years. Well, best of luck with that. And we'll all be watching here at Sports for Champions. And I'm sure everybody will be watching at home. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. No, you're more than welcome. And thank you to everyone who's watching at home. Uh, it's been another great episode of the Sports for Champions podcast. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. Hi guys, hope you enjoyed the podcast. If you did, be sure to leave us a like and a subscribe and check out all our other videos for some more great interviews and content. Bye.